Good evening. I'm Steve Wheatley, the Vice President of the American Council of Learned Societies, and it's my privilege to introduce the two distinguished colleagues whose conversation will be the keynote and the capstone of this inaugural symposium of the loose ACLS program in religion, journalism, and international affairs. This conversational format enacts the program's basic aim. Scholarship and journalism are two distinct practices of producing knowledge, each with their own standards, protocols, uh, perspectives, and time horizons. But both scholarship and journalism confront the enormous challenge of applying reason to the analysis of complex and sometimes confusing dimensions of human behavior. The loose ACLS program seeks to braid together these two strands of knowledge production so as to produce a keener public understanding of how religion shapes our world today. Emma Green is a staff writer for The Atlantic, where she covers politics, policy, and religion. The length of that short sentence, which constitutes her entire bio, bio in our program, <laughs> belies the respect which she has earned in her meteoric rise. She graduated from Georgetown in 2012 with a BA in government and has worked for The Atlantic on a series of roles since, in a series of roles since then. When we asked the loose ACLS fellows whom they admired among journalists covering religion, Green's name came up most often. In a 2016 interview with Crux Magazine, she outlined the broad frame of reporting on religion. I see religion angles everywhere, she said. Many issues that are putatively economic or political or cultural are deeply rooted in people's faith moral views, and metaphysical commitments. I feel like I have the best beat in the world because I get to talk to people about some of their most personal experiences and beliefs, along with the clashes of those experiences and beliefs. The Reverend Dr. David Gushy is Distinguished University Professor of Christian Ethics and Director of the Center for Theology and Public Life at Mercer University. He is also the current President of the American Academy of Religion, one of the constituent members of the American Council of Learned Societies. Widely regarded as one of the leading moral voices in American Christianity, he is the author or editor of 20 books and hundreds of articles in his field, including Righteous Gentiles and of the Holocaust, Kingdom Ethics, The Sacredness of Human Life, and most recently, Changing Our Mind. Dr. Gushy has always accompanied his scholarly production with church work, now at the First Baptist Church of Decatur, activism in human rights, creation care, LGBT acceptance, opinion writing in the Washington Post, Huffington Post, Baptist News Global, and now Religious News Service, board service with the public religion research, Sojourners, and the Center of, for Victims of Torture, and domestic and global media consultation. Uh, Emma and David will each make a few introductory remarks and, remarks and then begin the conversation with each other and then with the audience. Emma will begin. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and I apologize about my short bio. Um, I'm really happy to be here speaking with all of you, and it's such an honor to be at the Columbia School of Journalism. Uh, as I was just saying, uh, there are rock stars of religion journalism who teach in these halls, and it's an honor for me to get to sit on stage and share some of my views about religion and media and the future stories ahead on our beat. I want to start out with the story of two corrections, uh, two corrections which show both the spirit of religion being back in the news and also some of the foibles of religion being back in the news. Uh, the first uh, struck me in particular because I've been in Jerusalem for the past eight months or so and and a recent Wall Street Journal article, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was quoted as uh, describing Moses as getting water out of Iraq, the country, rather than Iraq, <laughs> as the story of the Bible says, uh, which of course was incorrect and had to be corrected. Uh, and the second was an NPR story recently uh, that was marking the coming of Easter. And I'll read this original rendering of the description of Easter. Easter, the day celebrating the idea that Jesus did not die and go to hell or purgatory or anywhere at all, but rather rose into heaven, is on Sunday. <laughs> Which is wrong for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but what struck me about that correction in particular is uh, 
what was clearly a grasping by the reporter who was trying to write the description of Easter, who was a politics reporter at NPR, this very apparent discomfort with trying to relate to these concepts and know how to portray this to her readership. I bring these up uh, in part because uh, this is sort of relevant for what we're talking about here today, religion being back in the news, what to make of that, what to do about it. And I don't bring it up to trash on other journalists because there but for the grace of God go I. I have made so many stupid mistakes in my time as a reporter and everybody who works in this industry does. So uh, I do not want to sort of use this as an opportunity to make fun of other people's religious illiteracy. But I do think these two examples underscore the breadth of the challenge that we face uh, as people presumably who care about seeing religion and non-religion and all of these ideas covered in thoughtful ways. Uh, see it done with nuance and a degree of literacy, and not just on the religion beat itself, but across news desks and different parts of the newsroom. Dean Becquet, the executive editor of the New York Times, right after the 2016 election, gave an interview with Fresh Air. He was talking about how the Times relates to religion, and he said, media powerhouses don't quite get religion. We don't get religion. He gave a shout out to Larry Goodstein, who was then the only full-time beat reporter in a newsroom of you know, more than a thousand journalists uh, covering religion full-time, uh, but basically recognized that this was one of the reasons why the New York Times had failed in the 2016 election to fully understand what was going on culturally and politically in America. This, I think, uh, is as good a marking point as any for religion being back in the news, or maybe to put it in a different way, newsrooms and editors waking up and suddenly realizing that there are significant aspects and dynamics of American culture and politics that we've been missing. And the way that newsrooms have handled that has not always been great. Um, and I want to go through a few reasons why I think it's important for newsrooms to take religion seriously, to put resources behind religion, to also take seriously the amount of deficit in knowledge and subtlety that currently exists in American media. Um, but I also want to use this opportunity, being at Columbia, being part of the symposium on media and academia and the connection between those two, to sort of make a call for why I think it's important that people who know religion best, scholars of religion, and the journalists who are, who are dutifully trying to report on religious topics, to work together and team up in this time when religion coverage is so important and there are so many deficits that we sort of have to overcome as an industry. I want to do this by marking out what I see as three of the major buckets for topical coverage that I think will be important, especially in the coming three or so years as we're in this political cycle. Um, I want to, first of all, caveat to say I have a tendency to speak in a political idiom, in part because I'm staffed on our domestic politics team, uh, so I sort of think in terms of politics and elections, um, but I don't think that politics is the only frame for understanding religion, and in fact I'll come back to that as one of the sort of deficits in how religion is often covered. So. Starting there, the first major topic that I see ahead for religion journalists and newsrooms more broadly is political power and influence and the role that religious actors and religious groups have in influencing elections and political coverage. The big elephant in the room here is uh, white evangelicals in the United States who have been talked about nonstop, especially since the 2016 election, with that infamous number that I feel like I've heard and read maybe thousands of times since then, the 81% or 80% of white evangelicals who voted for Trump in the 2016 election. It's been really interesting in the past two or so years, 18 months, to watch the way that evangelical power has sort of entered this cycle of redux. I wasn't really alive in the 80s, but it, uh, if I were, I, I feel like I would be having a moment of uh, sort of nostalgia or uh, amnesia because it, it feels like some of the visions or the visuals of the moral majority and the 1980s and 90s culture wars have basically been resuscitated, uh, both in the figures who we've seen mentioned in the news and being in the halls of the White House, Ralph Reed, James Dobson, uh, but also just in the dynamics of white evangelicals having such a visible power role at the White House and in our politics. And I'm specifically talking about white evangelical elites and leaders. 
covering this group accurately, uh, not only covering in a really critical and appropriate way journalistically the people who are holding positions of power politically, these white evangelical leaders, but also evangelicals more broadly, I think is really important to understanding what's going to happen in 2018 and again in 2020. Um, and that's something that I would love to talk about with you, David, because this is an area that you have a lot of expertise on. But um, this is sort of one thing that I think journalists have to keep their eye on across these many desks. The next is just generally thinking about how religion is going to play a role in political mobilization at all as we approach a midterm election and then a presidential election in two and a half years. There's often a fallacy that uh, reporters will make, and particularly political reporters will make, which is talking about religious people and religious ideas only insofar as they're relevant to the voting booth. And I, I don't agree with this. I don't think this is the right way to cover religion. Religion is unto itself an important topic. And yet, uh, when we're talking about this big bucket frame of political power and influence, um, I think voter mobilization and the way that religious organizations are key to voter mobilization is going to be a huge topic to look to ahead, especially as different religious groups have been very divided in this political time. And finally, a topic that my colleagues on the religious beat are always returning to, sort of perennially hopeful but perennially disappointed, is whether or not there will be an emergent religious left politically in the US. Um, and again, it takes a certain amount of skill to look at uh, these groups and their institutions who are on the left, who are religious, and actually critically question whether or not they'll have the ability to uh, have an influence on our elections. Um, and it's not enough just to sort of quote and take their press releases and digest them in a superficial way. The second bucket I'll offer um, in terms of these big topics ahead uh, is in general the bucket of religious freedom. And the scholars in the room, I'm sure, may have an allergy to that term, in part because it's a vexed term. Um, it's often a space and a term that's owned mostly by uh, conservative Christians. And especially recently, the way that we, as sort of newsmakers and intellectuals and people who talk about stuff, think about religious freedom and religious liberty is often only in the very narrow lens of birth control, abortion, LGBT rights. Um, sort of a very narrow cast of what religious freedom is. But I bring it up because I do think that in this political environment under the Trump administration, talk about religious freedom and changing frameworks of religious freedom are very important to understanding what our government is doing, especially the White House and the executive branch. Uh, and covering these topics, having familiarity with them is going to be very, very important for reporters across those desks. Um, we see this at the Supreme Court, which has taken up many, many cases in the past four or five years that have to do with topics having to do with the First Amendment and religious liberty. They have more that are coming. The famous Cake Bakers case out of California or out of Colorado, excuse me, is coming up this spring. Um, so that will continue to be a cyclical issue. Uh, and all of this, in general, is a signal of immense cultural change. The clashes that we're seeing over religious liberty, even in that narrow cast of birth control and abortion and LGBT rights is a sign of something very deep that's happening in American culture around division and divisiveness, um, which I think will be uh, important to sort of mark and really engage with. Uh, one thing that I find to be frustrating often in the media, uh, not to perpetuate a stereotype and a cliche, but a, a sort of liberal framework or a liberal mindset in coming to topics of coverage, less because I think my colleagues in the news media are so liberal that they can't be fair and can't be accurate, um, but in terms of the questions that newsrooms think to ask, uh, the kinds of anxieties that they think to dignify, um, I think there's often sort of a disconnect in how newsrooms are covering uh, the cultural changes that are underlying all of these uh, big issues that I was talking about in terms of religious freedom. And the final bucket I'll offer is religious minorities. Um, and again, this term is sort of a vexed term in the sense that uh, not every min minority is created equal, and thinking about a minority group in terms of numbers doesn't necessarily help us to understand fully whether they're minority in terms of influence or power or relative amount of wealth. But I do think that there are some pretty deep existential questions that have been challenging uh, within these communities, these communities that are small in numbers in the US, their own sense of identity, uh, their own questions about how they can sort of be in America at this time. Uh, I'm thinking about this a lot in terms of anti-Semitism, uh, the alt-right and white supremacy. We saw this in Charlottesville, which was a huge story, but it goes deeper than that. Uh, the day after the election, I was covering for uh, the Atlantic in Pennsylvania, and one of my first stops uh, the day after was at a synagogue where a group 
of uh, congregants at the synagogue in suburban Philadelphia were having a sort of venting session, therapy session, whatever you might call it. And the thing that I heard that struck me the most was this deep, deep fear that these topics that we as a society and a culture had thought were sort of put away in dustbins or in closets with mothballs have really reemerged as politically salient. Um, and anti-Semitism is a huge part of that. Racism is a huge part of that. Um, I think similarly, uh, target, targeting against Muslims, Islamophobia, um, hate crimes and bias incidents. This is a very uh, tricky topic and an important topic still. Uh, data and reporting on hate crimes is notoriously hard to pin down. The FBI uh, is the most reliable sort of compiler of hate crime statistics, but they lag several years behind. So it's very hard to tell in real time what's happening. Um, I do want to shout out my colleague Hannah Alam, who's um, on the Religion Beat, who at BuzzFeed uh, put together a list of 49 states where Republican legislators had made comments about Muslims that were sort of calling out uh, things about them that they didn't like. They were, you know, base bigotry. Um, that kind of reporting is really important, and it's the kind of reporting that is so hard to do. It's the hardest kind of reporting because it's trying to take all of these things that are floating culturally and that are very small and actually bringing them into a focus as sort of a systemic phenomenon that's happening in America. Um, there's a big part of this issue with religious minorities, which uh, we can sort of talk about in terms of the rhetoric politically that's happening right now. Um, obviously, President Trump has uh, in some ways contributed to inflammatory uh, rhetoric against religious minorities, especially Muslims, uh, in varying ways. Uh, Jewish communities have pointed out some of President Trump's rhetoric and the messages that he's lifted up as being inflammatory. Um, but I also think that we have to, as reporters across desks, look at these issues in a deeper way, in a more fundamental way. Um, I think about this in particular with some of my pet issues, uh, things that I like to read and write about that are sort of hard to sell in this time of uh, rhetorical flashiness and crazy stuff happening in our politics. Mm -hmm. um, and the biz biggest example that comes to mind is on land use and zoning law, um, which I wrote a feature about last fall. Um, this is one of the greatest issues or I should say most frequent issues for religious groups that are trying to renovate their houses of worship, build new houses of worship, get some sort of zoning approval, and it's all happening at the local level. So it's again really hard to pin down and think about systemically. Um, but ultimately, I think those kinds of slow moving issues that existed before Trump will keep going on after Trump are some of the most important for us to pay attention to as reporters. So thinking about those big buckets, that sort of laundry list that I offered you of the types of issues that I'm thinking about that I have flagged in my own coverage uh, for keeping tabs on as we look ahead to the next year and a half, three years. Um, the big question is, what do we do about this? That there's so much happening, that religion is back in the news, that newsrooms have this sense that they don't get religion right, but they don't exactly know what to do about that. And so I have a few thoughts on that. The first is, of course, that newsrooms and editors need to make a commitment with resources and personnel to not only the religion beat and having religion reporters, which is very important, but also training reporters across different desks to be religiously literate, to see religion angles in their topical areas, whether that's an economics reporter, somebody who's on a sports desk, somebody who's in a culture desk, uh, and really back up and support the idea that religion is an important and acceptable frame for thinking about the news and the events that are happening in the world. But the second thing uh, that I think is most relevant for this audience is a call to scholars and academics to treat journalists kindly, be gracious with your time, and be open-hearted. Um, I really sincerely believe that academics have a lot to offer the public. And I know that there are differing views within the academy on the right posture to have towards public scholarship, engaging with the public. It's a guild, you're creating new knowledge and you're writing papers mostly for each other. And I understand that. Um, but at the same time, I have benefited tremendously by talking to scholars who do religious studies or religious history and just having their patience to walk along with me. The best interviews that I've done with academics I've almost felt like a student again, where an academic sort of knows what I'm trying to ask and knows what I'm grasping at and can guide me towards that. 
Um, and I'm so immensely grateful for people who give that time and that graciousness to walk alongside me as a reporter. So in general, I do think that if you're someone who is a scholar of religion, who studies these areas, who does have that expertise, having the patience to work with the foibles of journalists who are very annoying people, and to try to bring some of that scholarly work to a bigger platform is really, really important in this time, in particular when religion is back in the news. Um, so hopefully we can sort of join hands in a very uh, happy rainbows, you know, happily ever after way uh, and, and do a collaborative work to, to bring religion back into the news in a way that has subtlety and nuance and take seriously all of these things that are happening in these times. Uh, it is an honor to, to be here at uh, Columbia. I appreciate all of the co-sponsors, including uh, ACLS and Luce and Columbia. It, it was really quite uh, striking to see the poster that had your name and my name on it out here. 30 years ago, I was a student here at Union Seminary and took classes here at Columbia. And I walked by those, uh, you know, those placards or whatever, and it was never, I was never featured in one. Um, uh, 30 years later, it's, it's an honor to be back and uh, to be here uh, speaking at Columbia and to be uh, with Emma and with all of you. Um, the long view, uh, I think, is part of what I'm going to emphasize this evening. Um, I'm old enough to, to know a longer trajectory. I was alive in the 80s. Um, and. Um, to, to know a, a trajectory of religion coverage and to have been a part of it in some ways. So I want to talk a little bit about that, um, just a little bit more about um, who I represent in a sense this evening. At one level, I'm representing the American Academy of Religion, uh, where I'm privileged to serve as president this year. The AAR is a member of the ACLS, has a strong relationship with Luce as well. And um, in our new strategic plan we are, that is rolling out right now, uh, we are elevating the public understanding of religion to being part of our mission statement right alongside advancing scholarship in religion. So the American Academy of Religion, if we execute our strategic plan, will be much more, attempting to be much more involved as an organization in advancing the public understanding of religion. Uh, hopefully we will staff up for that and we will be even more in intimately and intensely related with religion coverage uh, than we ever have been. Um, so that's the AAR side. Uh, professionally, my training is in Christian ethics. Uh, I, I was trained in one of the strongest bastions of the religious left that there still is, and that's Union Seminary just uh, down the street. Um, and. Uh, but before that, I was trained at Southern Baptist Seminary, which is now one of the strongest bastions of the Christian right, where I also then went to teach when I finished at Union. And so I, I have been doing left-right whiplash for 30 years, <laughs> and that helped, that informs part of um, what I, you know, my understanding of this whole very fractured and difficult landscape. Uh, it's not just about covering religion, it's about covering the deep, fractures in American life um, that are often, at least partly, mappable along religious lines. So I, I have been a part of that evangelical world. I styled myself a progressive evangelical, and there are such. Um, more recently, I, the label has become tainted for me beyond repair, um, but that has been a, a part of my story as well. Um, another thing I've tried to be in my career is somebody who is simultaneously all along doing academic work and public uh, uh, and media work. I think it's the tradition in which I was trained. Um, my professors uh, were deeply influenced by Reinhold Niebuhr, who, who did his work around the corner here. And Niebuhr not only was heavily involved in um, um, public life, State Department, stuff like that, he also did religious journalism his whole career. Um, did a lot, of, a lot of media interviews as well as uh, weekly opinion writing and uh, other kind of uh, influencing by popular writing. And he helped to pioneer that 
uh, at least in the tradition in which I was trained. The idea, I think, in Christian ethics for a long time, at least as Christian social ethics, has been our work is not successful if we are not engaging the public. And so, um, so part of how I've tried to actualize that is ever since there has been a religion beat in various publications, I have been doing opinion writing, there are names of now long dead or, or barely alive organizations that I, I, I started doing this in the 80s, like Crosswalk and BeliefNet. Um, for a while, um, Huffington Post was the main place, um, and now they've, they've moved away from that. I, I was one of their columnists. Paul Rauschenbusch uh, played a key role with that. Um, the, uh, I was a columnist for Christianity Today um, for various iterations of the Baptist media and then with Religion News Service. And so um, I've been trying to do religious, religion journalism the whole time, at least more on the blogging and op-ed side. Um, and it's a model that is, is difficult to sustain, but I think I'm noticing now more and more religion scholars are attempting to do the same thing from a variety of different pathways in. Uh, and so, so that's been interesting to watch. And at the AR meeting uh, this fall, we're going to have two presidential plenary sessions. One uh, that features top religion journalists like Emma, and the other that features uh, academics who, uh, who have a, a substantial public platform um, and have them talk about how they've developed that. Um, what they have been attempting to achieve with that, and what price they have paid in trying to do that. Part of what I have noticed that has changed the most since I began this work 30 years ago is how vicious the atmosphere of conversation is now. Um, the, uh, it used to be unusual to get death threats. I got my first death threat probably about 1993. Um, but it was rare. Now it's routine. Uh, the social media environment especially uh, appears to be uh, breeding hate and contempt in a way that we all must take seriously. Um, so, I, so I think that's interesting. I'd like to talk about that some. Um, I've also watched the ups and downs of ev evangelical engagement in politics really almost back to the beginning of the Christian right, the new Christian right in the late 1970s. Um, so, I, I don't think that the media has rediscovered evangelicals. I don't think it ever stopped paying attention to evangelicals or the Christian right. Um, I do think that every election cycle gives us new information about what is happening with the organized political Christian right and what is happening with American evangelicalism, uh, the, probably, I mean, the largest Protestant religious movement in America. Um, and I think the Trump phenomenon and how white evangelicals have offered his strongest base of support is new information that needs to be analyzed and discussed and it's worth talking about. Finally, I, I want to tell you a story about how important it is to have religion reporters who have some idea what they're talking about. Um, I, uh, I, in a small town where I used to teach, um, I had a book come out and the local newspaper decided to try to cover it. And they sent out a reporter who didn't know much about religion. And the book was called A Bolder Pulpit, and it was about how you address moral issues. Uh, I showed her the book. She wrote it down. When it showed up in the newspaper, it was called A Soldier Pulpit. A Soldier Pulpit. That, it, was, it was not right. The other thing was uh, my president was interviewed, and he described me as a convictional evangelical. OK? Two big words. I get it. It was rendered in the newspaper as a conventional angelical Christian. <laughs> so of all the different types of angelics, I was a conventional type of angelic. Um, I mean, it is interesting how many times I have been interviewed, especially in the smaller local settings, by reporters who have no earthly idea what they're asking about. The, um, the the weakening of newsrooms generally is obviously we know about this. Part of the weakening of newsrooms is, is a, a thinning out of coverage in most areas. A religion is often cut. It looks like religion reporting at any, at any uh, serious level is now confined 
to less than 20 people in the United States. And, but what do you do in Atlanta when Billy Graham dies and you want to do a lot of feature on Billy Graham? Who's going to do that coverage? Mm -hmm. What do you do um, wherever a major religion related news story breaks out in one of the smaller markets? Um, it's part of an overall uh, very worrisome trend um, that feels like the dumbing down of America to me and certainly the weakening of, of mainstream media. So could I, maybe if we're going to move into conversation, could I start there? Do you have any hope that the, the stripping down of religion coverage and the, and the letting go of religion reporters is going to be reversed? Mm. Well, I should start by saying that uh, that 20 people number that you threw out is probably actually much smaller in terms of full-time religion reporters who work at national or large or mid-sized regional papers. I would say it's probably a dozen, 15. Um, and it kind of depends on how you count and who you're counting. But um, I always like to say the religion beat is the nicest beat and the most collegial because there are so few of us. So we really do have a small band of extremely kind uh, fellow cheerleaders who are always looking to see religion covered because there are so few of us and there are so many stories that we really don't have to be that competitive with one another, um, although we are a little bit competitive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the hope, I don't have a ton of optimism which I say cautiously being here at a graduate school of journalism, uh, not to be too uh, depressing and a cloud, a cloud of darkness cast over your education. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that a lot of newsrooms have followed what to me has always seemed like a very logical strategic path, which is to not only hire religion reporters, but hire people who can write religion stories in other B areas. And I say that as a wise strategic path in part because the dirty little secret of religion news is that it gets really well read. Uh, people are very, very interested in it. And from a business model perspective, it's harder potentially to sell ads against religion news or advertisers might be a little bit squeegeeer about that. But in terms of readership, people are hungry and the bar is quite low, not to demean readers or to demean reporters, but really any serious treatment of religion is often met with a basic appreciation that somebody took the time to become fluent in the technical aspects of whichever religious tradition is relevant, uh, that it's being given a sort of treatment that dignifies it and not necessarily flatters it, but at least treats it as a, a sort of serious practice. Um, and that reporters are trying to figure out what's happening within those communities and the questions that those communities are asking. I, you know, for whatever reason, this is not the conventional wisdom among especially uh, New York media market newsrooms. I do think that some editors have uh, awoken to the fact that people want to read this. These are important topics and they can make for great stories. And so there have been outlets that have hired up around religion. I'm very lucky to work for a publication that has been very serious about its religion coverage and very supportive. Um, my colleague Sagal Samuel is here. She heads up our global religion coverage and edits and commissions work on that. Um, and to me, that's a sign that our editors really do take this quite seriously. But that's sort of the exception, not the rule. Um, the final thing I'll say, not to go on too long about the terribleness of uh, media ahead, is that my great fear is not really for national newsrooms, although obviously that's important. It's mostly for um, those local and mid-sized regional publications, sort of the daily newspaper scene, because in terms of the economics of the news industry, those publications are by far getting hit the hardest uh, in terms of layoffs and lack of resources. Um, but also, those are the newsrooms where religion reporter positions are being cut um, and really actually have already been cut. It's already been done. Um, essentially, the Salt Lake Tribune is one of the only of those sort of mid-sized regional publications that has a consistent religion reporter, with some exceptions. Um, so that, to me, is much more depressing because those are the people who can really see what's happening in specific local communities and help to surface stories that get picked up by national reporters. And without that infrastructure, I think the news business is uh, really in dire straits. Okay. Um, can I ask you one other question? Well, I think you can ask me as many All as right, you then want. You can ask me you're the one. boss. Oh, no, no, you're the boss. Um, what has surprised you the most 
in covering evangelicals since 2015? Part of it is the retro feeling, uh, which is some of these figures who you know, were around in the 80s and 90s have sort of been reanimated as though they sort of went into cryogenic freezing <laughs> and then just came out to, you that know, That is what happened. <laughs> yes, I've, I've solved it. Uh -huh. um, it, it. It really is pretty amazing, uh, the dynamics that do resemble a time past in American politics. And uh, trying to figure that out has actually been quite a puzzle. I'm fairly skeptical that American evangelicalism is at a similar place, or is at at least the same place as it was in the 80s and 90s. I think the demographics are different. I think the population of the sort of foot soldiers beneath those organizations are different. I think structurally, uh, who has influence and what kinds of institutions they're working through to have influence is pretty different. Um, and yet, the imagery of evangelicalism feels like it could have been taken out of 1992 or 1985. Um, so that has been, has been fairly surprising, and uh, figuring out how to relate to that, not only as someone who's trying to get access and figure out who's who and you know, do that hard-hitting reporting, but also just who to talk to, who to anoint as an accurate leader who actually has representative speaking power of different populations of evangelicals, trying to get at different populations, those people who aren't represented by those Trump evangelical advisors, but who are just as influential in the movement um, and in their own denominational context. Um, so certainly they have been a big, a big topic of both uh, sort of consternation in terms of how to cover, um, but also just sort of amusement at times. Mm -hmm. uh, here's where I would say the continuity is. Um, white evangelicals uh, have been arguing since the 70s, really before, but that's when we started to notice them, that uh, American culture was sliding into perdition uh, based on um, loss of moral values. And so the, the agenda really since Falwell um, was make America great again by uh, restoring America to God. And, um, and then the strategy was, looks like we are not going to be able to s uh, evangelize a sufficient number of people to our way, to our faith practice, though we're going to keep trying that. We need to engage the politicians. And the strategy was a, a, a partnership with the Republican Party, a partnership um, that was initially kind of a partnership of convenience. You give us what we want, we'll give you what you want. Um, and that really kicked off with Reagan. And that strategy, I think the strategy fused, eventually became uh, not just a strategy, but an identity. Uh, white evangelicals came to identify, and there's data on this now, came to identify core aspects of who they were with republicanism, mm -hmm. especially uh, in the South, but not only there. And, and so I think that the idea is we'll keep v turning out our foot soldiers to elect Republicans. They're supposed to continue to deliver what we're asking. If they don't, we'll be angry, but the next time we'll vote for them again. And, but what they always had with it was at least the faux kind of, this is a man of God thing. Uh, George W., man of God. Um, Mitt Romney, well, Mormon man of God. A little bit of a problem, but you know, we'll go with it. Um, Trump, to me, poses uh, the great negation of the man of God thing and they are supporting him at a level higher than any previous Republican president, which is worthy of the, the greatest attention both from journalists and from academics as to what does this mean. And in, fairness, in all fairness, there are a lot of uh, white evangelicals, and not to mention evangelicals of color who are outraged on the whole, but there are a lot of white evangelicals who are um, very troubled by this development, who are asking what it does mean about their movement. And there's also a significant flow out into the ex-evangelical category of people who are like, this is not me. I want nothing to do with this. 
and uh, I am no longer an evangelical. Um, but, but anyway, I think this is a story that's going to continue to, to occur. It reminds me a little bit of reading research about evangelicalism like in Latin America. What uh, some research I saw uh, about evangelicalism in Latin America is that it often was not especially democratic, not especially rule of law oriented, um, and not especially about morality, it was about the gaining and holding of power and often got tied to corruption in Latin American countries. And I'm concerned that that's what, what is happening is a kind of a metastasizing of white evangelicalism into a movement that is aiding and abetting political corruption in the United States that is going to lead to the complete moral discrediting of white evangelicalism in America. I do want to challenge your narrative a little bit, okay. uh, which maybe, I don't know if this is what we're supposed to be doing, like Thunderdome over evangelicals up here <laughs> on stage. Um, but you know, one of the things that's been most interesting to me, and again, thinking about it not as a sort of normative claim about whether evangelicals behaving this way or that way is good or bad, but just as a reporting challenge, uh, has been trying to figure out how to access people who have radically different takes on this time and how to interpret Trump and how to interpret our political moment. Um, there was a book that recently came out from University Press called Still Evangelical. And it was mostly a compilation of evangelical writers and professors and thinkers who were taking on this question of whether they still identified as evangelicals. And most of them, by self-confession, would put themselves more in a sort of center or center-left positionality. And they were all elites. I don't think a single one of them was an out-and-out -out Trump supporter. So in that way, they were totally non-representative. Uh, but one of the streams in that, the themes that was part of that book that I found to be so important, which is relevant to your description there, was this sense of mutual embarrassment that even though these were mostly never Trumpers who didn't understand what was happening in their movement, they did recognize that they were embarrassed of their co-religionists, the people in the church pews beside them, but also those people were embarrassed of them, that they felt judged, that they felt like they were elitist, that they felt like this certain sector of evangelical elites was sort of thumbing its nose at the evangelical populace. And we've seen this theme play out quite a bit in a number of uh, sort of interdenominational spats and fights since the election. Um, so I just think that's important to flag, which is not presuming too much, but you are an elite. Um, I don't know if you would still call yourself evangelical. Um, but the sort of narrative there, even the story that you're telling about what's happening inside of your own world is coming from a very specific position and one that I would think other evangelicals would see as totally the opposite, right. which, is, which makes this all so much more interesting for journalists. It is. I mean, the, the, the all, I mean, we heard earlier today in a meeting, I mean, r religions are, you know, are internally uh, pluralistic. And I think we're seeing some of that pluralism uh, within evangelicalism. And for me, at least, uh, I'm wanting to pay a whole lot more attention to, to people who have the same basic conservative, pious religiosity, but come from uh, racial and ethnic places other than whiteness. And I, I, that's where I'm going for hope, but it's also where I'm going for interpretation of what is going on. Mm. Um, I wanted to say one other thing about the religious liberty thing, and then we should throw it open for questions, I think. Um, it's interesting that um, what I, the way I interpret the current evangelical cry for religious liberty is, in a sense, it's a, uh, an acknowledgment that the mainstream argument over, over their value positions has largely been lost. So um, religious liberty used to be about, um, you know, for dissenting uh, or non-believing people to have the freedom not to practice their religion. And now it's where dissenting more conservative people are arguing for the freedom to practice their religion, um, believing that it is at risk. Mm. And, and so that's, the, that's how the religious liberty conversation has shifted. But the idea in the 70s is we're going to take America back again. We're going to get prayer back in the schools. We're going to roll back the feminist movement. We're going to roll back the sexual revolution. We're going to roll back abortion. All of that didn't happen. And so now it's, okay, we've lost all of that. We're just going to try to protect the space 
for us to practice our values. Um, now, of course, what the courts have to sort out is what is the line there. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, the, it's like a last stand of a, of a group that simultaneously feels large and powerful, on the other hand, feels embattled and persecuted. And that combination is a very interesting one to watch. Mm. Does anyone have questions? Yeah. Jean-Paul, do you want to you wanna recognize the hands? Do you want us to point out the hands? We have two folks okay. who are watching. Okay. Thank you both for this. I'd, I'd love to hear a comment about this, especially about evangelicals. What I didn't hear you quite say and I'm thinking about this, you know, especially on the state level with the kinds of reporting that could happen, is a place like Texas where you've had all this rollback in reproductive rights that has gone into sort of, you know, connects to the religious freedom piece. And, I, you know, somebody said to me the other day, they said, well, maybe the last stand for evangelicals is always going to be abortion. Because that's the thing that they that changed that they started off with in the seventies, you know, right? That switched everything that made them become political. So I'd be interested in both of you just commenting on that briefly. So one of the things that I often do cover that's not explicitly about religion, but is sort of that two or three neighborhoods away is abortion and reproductive rights and the pro life movement, which always has that religious underpinning to your point. And one of the things that I find so interesting about the abortion debate is that it's almost never changing uh, in the sense that on the one hand, it has changed, the legislative context has changed, the Supreme Court context has changed, um, but in terms of polling on abortion, in terms of continued cultural ambivalence around abortion, in terms of a sort of generational replenishment of those foot soldiers in the pro-life movement, it stayed fairly consistent um, since Roe. And so what I think is so interesting about your comment is that you've put your finger on one of the issues uh, that doesn't follow the trend that, that David described, which is in general having cultural positionality totally essentially be lost. On LGBT issues, um, the conservative Christian position is essentially you know, on the wane in terms of popular belief and, and law, um, certainly in terms of the broader theological and metaphysical claims of Christianity, um, you could argue that the church, the edges of the church at least, are sort of in erosion uh, in terms of secularity and how people are thinking about their own core commitments. Um, on that abortion issue though, I do think that the resilience of um, these institutional groups, the resilience of this as an issue that comes up in uh, legislation after legislation after legislation, um, and the resilience of the pro-life movement as a, a sort of cultural movement that's able to win people's sympathies from maybe unconventional corners means that this is an issue that is going to stay with us and is sort of uh, not appropriately lumped with the rest of these cultural issues because it follows a different pattern. I think that's true. I, I sometimes think that the only way that abortion will be taken off the table as a mobilizable, like there are people who will vote uh, Republican forever as long as abortion is pegged to Republican versus Democrat, right? At the national level. Everything else could be offensive, but abortion is it. If, if actually Roe or existing abortion law were sent back to the states, um, I think that it would be hashed out at a state by state level and it would no longer be mobilizable as a national uh, presidential level issue. Um, I don't know if it's gonna happen, it might. It's the fondest dream of the pro-life side. Um, but like with, consider assisted suicide. If assisted suicide had become a national right when the Supreme Court looked at that in 1995, then we would, then I think it would be abortion and assisted suicide would be what we'd be arguing about you know, every four years. We want the pro-life, that would be abortion and assisted suicide candidate. Um, but that went back to the states and it just doesn't have the political salience. It's actually dealt with at the practical level by states trying to figure out what, what reflects the values of our people. I think actually, Anthea, that what I'm coming to believe is that evangelical, white evangelicals last stand is actually on race. That's what Randall Balmer said all those years ago about evangelicals, that what they were really mobilizing on in the early 70s was school integration and the Bob Jones decision mm. and all of that. 
And so I am surprised to, but I th to find myself leaning in the direction that ultimately um, it's about the, the preservation of white supremacy. Um, and that's one reason, uh, that, I mean, that helps to explain some things that are otherwise not easily explainable. Thank you both uh, for this. Uh, my question uh, for both of you is where you see the evolving role of opinion journalism in this discussion. Uh, you know, I'm always really struck by your sort of exhortation for scholars to please be kinder and generous with their time. Uh, if you know you see opinion sections as or ideas sections as a place where you know that can happen while uh, you know spreading outward to other sections, other news desks, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, is opinion journalism a place where, you know, those sorts of uh, cues can be given to, you know, other reporters who are working in, on other beats, you know, hey, you should really pay attention to this. Just general comments on where you see that, that role. Mm. So certainly I think opinion journalism is important and academics who use those spaces to make arguments can be quite beneficial for the signaling effect that you're describing, sort of flagging that this is an issue to pay attention to from a reported side. I will express a little bit of skepticism about the opinion modality being the primary modality that academics embrace as their way of relating to mainstream publications for a couple of reasons. Um, the first I will draw from my experience when I was an editor for The Atlantic and I did frequently uh, commission work from academics. And I was shocked, which I shouldn't have been, I was naive, but I was shocked that the favorite moonlighting topic for academics who got to sort of take off all of the shackles of academia and take the publication out for a spin in you know, the mainstream media was to trash on religion. Um, I mean, over and over again, we got pitches from people across different disciplines who wanted to disprove God or talk about how stupid it was to believe in God, which, first of all, is fairly boring. Um, and second of all, it sort of shows to me that uh, some academics, I think, have a mindset which says, mainstream media is the place where you throw off discipline and all of that expertise that you cultivated so carefully over years of getting a PhD and being in the academy doesn't really matter because, hey, it's just the Washington Post, hey, it's just the Atlantic. <laughs> um, so, you know, first, it's encouraging a lack of discipline if you have that opinion mindset. And the second is that, um, and this is where I'll show my bias as a magazine journalist rather than a newspaper reporter, straight news, is that I think there can be a lot of value in making arguments that aren't specifically about airing one's opinion, as in, I personally believe X, Y, or Z, but rather saying, I have a context, a framework, a set of histories to understand why this is happening because of this, and you make an argument. Um, that distinction between argument and opinion is, is sometimes difficult, and we often at The Atlantic have a hard time helping people get quite there with the differences, but um, I actually think in terms of your own bylined work, um, academics shooting for that argument frame, using that history and that expertise to make an argument can actually be the best modality for public writing. Um, I'll briefly, I'd say uh, the 750 word opinion piece is, is, uh, has been a bread and butter for me. It's, it's comfortable, I know how to do it, and a lot, of, a lot of academics have some success with that. Um, but I personally would like to explore more long form writing and other kinds of things that are really more possible online or in magazines instead of in the newspaper. I also want to say that um, one of the things we've learned about the blogosphere of Facebook and Twitter is you can really, really stir up a hornet's nest by careless or, or angry um, 140 characters. I can't think of anybody who does that that we can think of. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but what happens is we there's more of a price to pay now. Careless. If academics get a little bit careless, or they're blogging late at night when they've had too much to drink or whatever, or they're not being very careful, um, you can really get yourself in trouble. Um, and the AAR is is regularly called on uh, to, uh, to advocate for scholars of religion who are in trouble at their home institutions or are in trouble with some members of the public uh, because of things that they have blogged or posted. And so um, anytime we put a pen 
virtual or not, to anything, we need to be aware that we will be held accountable for what we say. Now, some of it is grotesquely unfair. It's trolling and all of that, but we also need to be aware of we are being watched, and everything we say, we can't lose our rigor just because we're in an online space or whatever. Thank you. I want to turn the conversation back to the election cycle. And um, Emma, you referenced uh, organizations and sussing out the capacity to deliver on the press release. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. I'm actually curious on two kind of movements that have been receiving a lot of coverage, the, the revival of the Poor People's Campaign and the state mobilization efforts and the intra kind of faith coalitions as well as the interfaith coalitions that seem to be forming. Mm -hmm. And then the second is your assessment of the role that the Parkland students have kind of driven around the gun debate and the mobilization through houses of worship, particularly in the evangelical space. Um, so just to take your question in parts, uh, I think the Poor People's Campaign, which is the campaign being championed by the Reverend William Barber and a number of other uh, religious partners that he's developed, uh, started in North Carolina in rallying the North Carolina State Legislature, has now moved to sort of a national platform, is very important to watch. I think we don't know yet what the yields will be, and I say that only as a sort of note of caution, which is there's a lot of energy around that movement. I think Barber has been rightly identified as a, just a lightning figure in being able to uh, mobilize, excite people, have the authenticity of really representing an authentic religious community on the ground. But I, other than what's happened in North Carolina, which of course is huge, on a national level, I don't know that we have actual tangible demonstrations of what that will be. Um, and the reason why I offered my note of caution about the religious left, and this is sort of a bucket that we have to be trained on and serious on, is that there often is a lot of cheerleading in the media for organizations like this, rightful to give it coverage, rightful to recognize this as something that's sort of a turn point or inflection point. Um, but I often suspect that reporters really want this to be what religion looks like in America because they happen to lean to the left and, okay, maybe they're not so religious themselves, but if we have to do the religion thing, at least it could be something nice and progressive, right? Um, and, you know, that's fine. And I think the coverage is important. Again, like I affirm the need to cover it, but um, I'm always very much looking for those tangible outcomes about have you been able to produce you know, voter mobilization, have you actually been able to pressure legislators into producing XYZ outcome? Um, do you actually have some sort of that hard power rather than just sort of demonstrative power? Um, I'll turn it over to you for the other ones since that was sort of a long answer. Um, well, I'll jump in there. Um, it is true that religious left or progressive evangelical left, it's irresistible to the media because it's not what you, exp you, you know, everybody's tired of the Christian right and so can there be an alternative? And there also um, have been organizations that have existed in part to lift up the voices of more progressive religious figures. It's part of what Auburn does down the street here. Um, it's part of, of what Faith in Public Life has been about, um, an organization based in Washington. And that was very helpful for me. When I was, I was leading an activist campaign against torture after 9-11 from within the evangelical community, and the media were all over it. And it helped, and I think it did actually pay off in terms of putting some pressure from within the evangelical world on the Bush administration to roll, roll that back a little bit, and uh, it, I think it contributed. Um, when you think about the religious left, it helps to remember that mainline Protestant Christianity is smaller than it used to be, but it's not dead. There are still tens of millions of mainline Protestant Christians, National Council of Churches, type churches like United Methodist, the Episcopal Church, PCUSA, groups like that, and they tend to lean left. Um, and so they're out there, and they have an infrastructure. It's not as strong as it used to be, but it's there. And you have the historic black churches that not, I mean, not universally uh, progressive activists, but a lot of power is still there. You got uh, progressive Latinos and, and so on. So you add it up, um, it's not negligible. And I think uh, with Reverend Barber, we have the most inspiring single figure on the religious left in, in a long time. And so that's not, um, not to be overlooked. And a lot of sense that our politics is broken and that, um, that it's time for some fresh voices. So I'm actually a little more encouraged about the religious left right now than I've been in a while. Mm -hmm. 
Also, what the Parkland students are showing us is the power of a really skillful social media campaign with a compelling message and, and messengers. And I do think that social media is the province of the young. They're better at it. And they're, they're mobilizing very, very well. When people try to take down these Parkland kids, they know what to do. So I, I, somehow everything, I mean, I, I'm, finding a, I'm finding more hope in both of those sectors than I thought I would, and it's encouraging. Hi, uh, this is great so far. I wanted to ask you a question uh, that derives from some of my recent work, which is reading through uh, reporting on religion in America during the Cold War up until about the time of Reagan's ascension. And one of the things that I've noted is that um, there's so much reporting that includes discussion of religious ideas. So when Paul Tillich ends up on the cover of Time, there's lots of words ending in ology and ISM and so forth, and <laughs> that this trend continues throughout much of the 60s and 70s. Um, then, of course, it dissipates, and we have these polls recently that indicate that people in America who claim to be religious know very, very little about their doctrines. I think the last poll indicated that Mormons and agnostics knew the most and that evangelicals knew the least. But what I wanted to ask you is this. In your conversations with people, and Emma, maybe from the boots on the ground perspective, you can give some indication of whether people ever want to talk about religious ideas themselves. And if you think it's part of your job to get them to talk about it, and David, maybe a bird's eye view. Well, the simple answer is yeah. It's like in my job description to get people to talk about their religious ideas. and. I think part of uh, this idea, what I was describing earlier, the fallacy that religion is only important through the lens of politics or voter mobilization uh, is directly related to this, which is, uh, I think those ideas, the uh, core commitments that people have, um, philosophically, theologically, the way that that inflects their moral behavior and the formation of their communities, these are things to cover in their own right. And asking people about their beliefs is part of that. Of course, beliefs can't carry the day. It's uh, not just, religion is not just about sort of ideas in a vacuum that you can talk about abstractly. Um, but I do think that it's important to treat people's theological commitments as serious, to ask them about them, to ask them to talk about how their theology motivates them. Um, and I also think uh, it's interesting that you bring up this historical counterpoint because one thing that I notice a lot about contemporary media coverage that I talk about with my colleagues quite a bit is a sort of gun shyness from reporters in talking about what could be construed as a normative moral claim or something that is a contested notion of what truth is or the metaph metaphysical nature of the universe. Um, I think that that probably is produced by a lot of public pressures in terms of what is an appropriate framework for public discourse. Um, and there's a lot of pressure to sort of keep those ideas more private and just talk about religion as a sociological phenomenon or a political phenomenon. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think that religious ideas are important to report on. Um, I think that national politics and its fractures, by the way, there's a young lady here on the next to last row who's desperate to get in, so please give her the microphone next, right here, yeah. Um, I think that national political fractures are sucking up all the oxygen. We can't talk about anything else right now. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned even, I mean, we, there is still a world with lots of things happening, but if you, if you watch CNN, you would never really know it because it's the latest Trump scandal or whatever. So I'm concerned about that. Um, I think that ever, ever since the cultural divisions of the 60s and then the, the rise of the Christian right, the main storyline about religion is its mobilization for political purposes, uh, either left or right. You had the, the mobilization of religion for the civil rights movement and the mobilization of religion for the Christian right. And it's almost like we don't even remember how to talk about religion as an aspect of shaping people's worldview or, or how they raise their families or how they think about money or um, you know, what they hope for uh, or any of that. And so we need to remember that there are a whole lot of other aspects of religion besides how people cash it out for politics. Uh, you mentioned that there was a uh, there was newsrooms and editors realizing the importance of religion and talking about it. 
But you also said that there was a cut of journalists in the mid-level to local range, so there's no way to like get that um, that information to the national level. So I wanted to talk about the like how there would be a rise of talking about religion in media with this lack of journalists in that mid-level local range, especially towards religious minorities, such as Islam and other uh, religions in America right now. Mm. Certainly, I think it's a disjunct, and it's a disjunct in a couple of ways. The first is the mismatch of rhetoric and resources. So having the executive editor of the New York Times say we don't get religion, they just hired a second religion reporter, who's Elizabeth Dias from Time, who's wonderful. Um, so they're putting their money where their mouth is a little bit. Um, but you know, in general, uh, I do think there's sort of a mismatch between the lip service that's paid to religion as an important topic and the actual investment in religion as a strategic area of coverage. Um, but it's also the disjunct that you've pointed out, which is between those national newsrooms and this national discourse about religion, and then what's actually happening on the ground in those local papers, those regional papers. I think that that story, the story of local and regional news, is actually less to do with pervasive liberalism or not taking religion seriously, which you could make an argument is part of the motivation at the national level, and it just has everything to do with the economics of the news business. Um, I think newspapers that are going through rounds of layoffs where 50 journalists will lose their job in one go, uh, it's not that they're cutting the religion reporter and it's just about religion, it's that they're cutting you know, half of their newsroom. Uh, and that is a much bigger and thornier problem to try to solve. It's one thing to have a theoretical conversation about frameworks of coverage and taking religion seriously. It's much, much different to think about reinventing the business model of the news business. Um, so it's a hard challenge and I actually don't have an answer for you. If I did, I would be a consultant making bukus of money, you know, <laughs> brought into all of these local, local newsrooms, but it is a lament and a sadness that I feel about what's happening at those sort of local levels. Hi, thank you to both of you guys. Um, <clears throat> so recently, New York Times had an article relating to the Me Too movement, and it read, um, is Tariq Ramadan the Wein Harvey Weinstein of Islam? Now, Tariq Ramadan, for those who don't know, is a professor at Oxford who happens to be uh, Muslim. So I can't, I can't remember any other article the Times has written that connected all these fallen men to their religion. Mm. So, so this is one thing I think about. Like Times is like a flagship paper, yeah. well respected, does great job, but it's here enforcing this idea of problematizing Islam, even when you know, like there are a lot of all these other fallen men have done things. So I wanted to know if actually instead of illuminating their helping and caricature religions in general, and I've seen a lot of things in mainstream papers talking caricaturing Christianity, for example, making it like kind of extreme and all that stuff. Uh, quickly, I wanted to ask you, I, evangelicals, um, I would assume their natural allies would be, uh, you know, blacks and Hispanics because they're quite, uh, you, you would, there's a lot of religion in, in these communities, like strong uh, identification with religion. So how, how would, uh, in your conversation, how would they explain this, this, uh, this discrepancy between in, in that situation? Thank you. Um, so just starting with the first question about a sort of unfair characterization of Tariq Ramadan. Um, you know, I don't. I think I probably read that specific story, but I don't want to comment on it in particular because I don't have the specifics in mind. What I will say is that um, first, I think you're right to point out that the way the media talks about Islam is often different than the way the media talks about all sorts of other religious groups and people who are from other religious traditions. Um, this is a, a hugely thorny problem in terms of uh, thinking about the assumptions and narratives that go into people who are of a Muslim background, the way that that part of their identity is put forward or foregrounded in ways that are perhaps inappropriate. But in the defense of the Times and other publications that were talking about this, um, you know, Tariq Ramadan comes out of a scholarly context that's focused on Islam. 
Uh, so there's an argument to be made that he's sort of engaging explicitly professionally in the religious sphere. And also there have been analogous cases of papers focusing on church contexts. Um, so Church Me Too was sort of a side movement that was connected to the Me Too movement. Um, for example, there was a pastor in Memphis, Tennessee, who was uh, sort of charged with having committed an assault many years ago when he was a youth pastor who, through public pressure, through reporting, through the media, was sort of pressured to step down. That was very much framed as being in a church context because he was a pastor. Um, so I don't know that this particular case necessarily is the best for sort of speaking to those ironies and hypocrisies, although very much those are there. Um, and the final thing, just to speak for a moment to your question about um, Christians who are not white, which our conversation is very much focused on white Christians, in part because of the political context. Um, I will just say that in my reporting on race and churches, which is something uh, that I uh, think is hugely important for understanding American Christianity right now, American politics more broadly, <coughs> Um, I just see a lot of variation, and I don't think that um, a general claim about what white Christians think or white Christians generally discounting one population or another gets nearly enough at the nuance. Um, there are leaders, especially just speaking within, again, that white evangelical frame, um, who very much see the future of their church as being black and brown. Uh, Russell Moore, for example, who is somewhat more liberal within the Southern Baptist spectrum, has written extensively about the demographic change that is coming for the church and churches uh, and how Christians need to just embrace the fact that black and brown people are the future of Christianity in America. Um, I think though, sort of to your earlier point, David, about uh, how some of these political phenomena that we're seeing could be the product or the consequence of sort of a racial reckoning or a racial discomfort. Um, there have been a lot of varied outcomes within different church contexts about how white populations are dealing with demographic change and how that plays out in their own religious contexts. Um, so I guess the answer to that, which is maybe not a great answer, is it's really complicated. Um, and this is why I think it's important to see great journalism um, that's specifically focused on this topic of religion and race because it's a huge access point of what's going on right now in America. I'll just say briefly, uh, I, I'm in Atlanta and I've been in the South for most of my career. When a, a great case study is take uh, white Southern Baptists and black uh, Baptists in the South of various denominations, a lot of times sing the same hymns, um, uh, share much of the same religious tradition, uh, and vote in diametrically opposed ways. Um, and this is rooted in 400 years of history. Um, an understanding of where uh, justice lies and where their political interests lie. Uh, a shared evangelical faith is not nearly as powerful as the power of race and history. And that, I think, has to be accounted for. But that, um, it's, there's, there are obviously exceptions, but that's the overall pattern. Um, I think we're going to do two more questions. Thank you both so much for this. This was great. Hi, Megan Goodwin, Northeastern University. Um, I'm going to bullet point this because I was waiting a while. <laughs> no shade. Um, so I want to push back for a hot second about the separation of white supremacy and reproductive rights. And I really appreciated Dr. Butler's question on this. I think shorthand, I just wrote an article, uh, the subtitle of which is how women, queers, and people of color are paying for corporate Christian conscience. So I don't think, thinking about reproductive justice, which increasingly elides contraception and abortion, which is why I think those conversations are never just kind of religious, like the, the operations of the National uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops is directly involved in trying to undermine the, the contraceptive mandate, right? Um, point A. To, uh, I also think doc Dr. Butler is demonstrating the ways in which senior scholars can absolutely dominate social media. So if y'all aren't following her, you should get on that. Mm -hmm. But my actual do it. Uh, but my actual question um, goes back to David's point about the death threats. Um, one of the things that I was really surprised at when I saw public scholars who are brilliant and strong start talking in venues like the Atlantic, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, Kelly Baker's outstanding work on white supremacy and uh, the rise of the Klan. Um, she would do these amazing pieces. Pieces I use them in my classes, and she would inevitably get death threats and rape threats. And there is such a, 
physical vulnerability that goes along with doing this work um, that I think is so incredibly important. And I'm wondering, I'm not sure that there is an answer to this question, but I'm wondering if either of you have strategies for in any way inoculating yourself to that kind of violence because this work is so important. I wish I did. Um, I am more bothered by vitriol online than I would like to be. And some of my colleagues are just off Twitter, they just shut Twitter, you know, look at their mentions. Um, certainly there are some stories that I've published where my editor, right after he puts it up online, will say, RIP your mentions, and then I'll just shut the Twitter browser uh, and know that it's gonna be awful. Um, you know, I do think this is important, not just for scholars who maybe moonlight in the disgustingness of the internet, but for journalists who live there um, <laughs> in the pits. Um, I, I think there is, it, it is a, a non-zero non effect that the context of social media has on affecting how people do their public work in the sense that there's just enormous stakes um, for your own personal health and well-being, but also just for the level of conversation and level of spotlight uh, when any article is published, particularly on a controversial topic, which religion topics often tend to be. Um, I do think a lot in my work about public vulnerability in the sense of um, anybody who's sort of stepping out on a topic that has a lot of controversy around it is going to be extremely vulnerable and it can be a disincentive. It can just be a sort of a gut reaction of, Ugh, I don't really want to go through all of this. Um, and that matters even if journalists and academics in certain circumstances are bold enough to keep writing into spaces that are controversial and can just get tough skin and not really care if people are throwing insults at them and death threats and, and that sort of nastiness. Um, that psychological aspect is real uh, and I don't know what to do about it other than just to try to take heart and keep doing my job the best I can and I have a lot of really supportive colleagues and um, in general I think people tend to be nice there are nice people to balance out the nasty people um, so I try to take heart from that um, and keep writing um. In some ways, it's, it's almost, after a while, it doesn't even feel human. Like, the attacks, I mean, sometimes they are bots, but I mean, it's almost like hydraulic. You do this, this will happen, and you just, you get used to it. But in the AAR, we're talking about certain groups that have specific vulnerabilities, like, for example, non-tenured or uh, contingent faculty are more vulnerable. Because if you're attracting what is perceived by the administration as negative attention, then they might not renew you or might not promote and tenure you. So, and this is especially it appears to be tied to uh, to those who are racial of racial ethnic minority groups and women scholars, LGBTQ as well. So the same kinds of patterns of of oppression are especially reproduced. Um, it is not easy to get used to living with death threats. Um, the, the panel that uh, I've organized for AAR this fall that is about the, uh, kind of the public scholarly life is going to address this specifically. I think different people have different strategies. I do think that we need to be, a, I mean, as careful as we can in the work that we do um, so as to avoid unnecessarily becoming a target, but that, that's just, that doesn't resolve it. Uh, there's plenty of targeting that happens anyway. When I was asking for possible names of people who could serve on that panel, it was like an all-star team of horrors, you know? I mean, it was, it's dozens of scholars of religion who have various experiences of being targeted from all different directions for the work that we do. Um, and nobody's gotten physically harmed yet that I know about, at least in this recent era, but I'm genuinely concerned about it. So hopefully we can talk about some specific strategies more in November.